Hi, and welcome to Speaker Secrets 2, where top experts share their best tools for confident communication, leading with the heart, and living a life of purpose. My name is Susie Q, and today I am welcoming Clayton Olson to the show. Welcome, Clayton. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you here. Yeah. So Clayton Olson is an international relationship coach, author, and facilitator. Now, rather than teaching quick fix strategies, Clayton's coaching style works with the deeper drivers behind people's most painful experiences in relationships and adjusts those experiences so clients can secure a life they endear and a love that endures. He does this through private virtual coaching sessions and leads online group workshops internationally, both for men and women. Oh, it's so good to have you. I mean, relationship is like, it's like kind of like one of the biggest things in our lives. So thank you so much, Clayton, for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, just even that statement, relationships, one of the biggest things in our lives. I, I think it took me becoming a relationship coach to finally come to that realization. Wow. Yeah, I don't think that I actually had that as an orientation before I got into this business. And then this business actually taught me how important relationship is, ironically. Well, that leads me into my first question is like, tell us a little bit of your backstory and how you got into being a relationship coach. Yeah, yeah. So um, growing up, I had, uh, I would say, you know, loving parents, but a poor model for a relationship. Uh, my father suffered from alcoholism. And because of that, there was uh, this just, uh, there would be ruptures that would occur between him and my mom on a very frequent basis. I felt like he was unpredictable, even though I loved him very much. And when he passed, when I was 18, uh, he, he died of lung cancer. And it left me really picking up the pieces of what it meant to be a man. And also, uh, when he was out of the way, I was able to calm down and stop reacting to some of the chaos that I ensued as a child and uh, was able to start to architect what it means to be a man, what it means to be a man in relationship. And just over the years, I realized I had a lot of work to do. So uh, I got into neuro-linguistic programming when I was 18. I, had, I was going through a really rough time and was considering just calling it quits. And my mom had given me a book called The Structure of Magic by Richard Bandler. And that got me into language and this crazy notion that I could actually create my own experience rather than be victim to it. And so that got me into self-development and transformation. I went into corporate for my 20s and was in corporate tech sales for uh, quite a while. And at one point, I remember hitting 28 or 29 and craving a deeper authenticity. My role in corporate was to develop relationships with clients, deep relationships where they trusted me and they trusted the brand that I stood for, for me to be able to meet their needs and uh, deliver them whatever was promised. But I often found that I wasn't actually getting paid to have honest, real conversations with clients. I was more getting paid to tolerate other people's wounds. And I realized that I had to get out of the business because it felt like I was carrying way too much. So I ended up randomly getting into uh, an internet marketing business with an old mentor at the time and uh, ran operations for him and had a, 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 he had a list of people going through breakups. And so I just started coaching because there was a, a need for that. And as I started coaching, I started falling in love more and more with my clients. I started falling more and more in love with the gritty, real conversations where people will ripped open to a level of vulnerability that they may not have experienced since they were a kid. And I realized that like my heart just opened up and my expression as a human and as a man opened up within the business and the relationship coaching became a, a deep passion of mine. And so I've been doing that full time for about seven years now, and there's been multiple evolutions and iterations of it, many uh, shifts and evolutions of relationship with myself and relationship with my clients. And um, I don't see that stopping anytime soon. That's so powerful and beautiful. Thank you for that share. It's, it, it is amazing how when, when we can take those things, like the, the childhood where you don't have a role model and then, mm -hmm. and then become the, uh, the solution for that 
for yourself and for other people. So thank you. Uh, and, and you kind of started to touch on this just a little bit. Uh, I love your perspective that we're always in relationship, even when we're single. Mm. So can you share us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it comes from working with a number of clients who have been perpetually single and them thinking that they, uh, they don't know how to do relationship well. There's an insecurity that if they get into relationship, they're gonna lose it. Uh, there's some anxiety around that. And oftentimes that can st stop them before they even start. And so a reframe that I often give clients is that, you're, look, you're always in relationship and you actually get to practice healthy relationship now as a single person. And you don't need another warm body in front of you that is an, a potential intimate partner to do that. And what that does is that, number one, helps the person begin to develop a certain confidence and a confidence in themselves that they do have something powerful and beautiful to offer in relationship, which is, I would say, 90% of uh, solving someone's uh, self-worth issues and anxiety they might have uh, when they're standing in front of someone they desire. So when we talk about what does it mean that you're always in relationship, well, you might have on the surface, you might think, okay, well, I want a relationship, so that's a relationship with another person, but we're always in relationship with ourselves. So how are we talking to ourselves? How are we treating ourselves? How are we orienting towards ourselves when no one's looking? Are we our harshest critic? Do we have somebody running laps in our mind, uh, filling us with insecurity and not acknowledging perhaps the, the, the goals that we're achieving in life uh, or the fact that we're a loving, worthy human being. And just beginning to look at that relationship can shift your entire life. We also have a relationship with life, right? So if I was to imagine life, if I was to personify life as a human being, what is my relationship with that? Am I trusting of life? Do I believe that the world is a dangerous place and that I really need to look out and watch my back in order to survive? Some of these beliefs come from childhood. Right? Am I trusting that the universe is perhaps on my side and is going to provide me everything that I need to live a fulfilling life? Now, these might just sound like words, but in practice, these beliefs are two night and day different realities that one lives in. One that can ultimately lead to somebody to, to be in the dumps and feel completely depressed, and the other to have somebody who is feeling like a whole and complete human being that is fully satisfied whether they're in an intimate relationship or not. So just looking at relationship that way is I think an incredibly powerful and empowering orientation towards a relationship that has you realize, look, the game starts now, you're practicing right now and you can't hide from relationship, you're in it. So how are you showing up? How are you being? Perfect, that's super super helpful to start to open the doors to 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 have a broader view of what relationship is and uh i i love that you that one of the first books you read was richard bandler he's actually actually he's interviewed on this show as well so i love that the <laughs> amazing it's full circle <laughs> beautiful full circle so uh so it, is there like a step that people can start to take on their way to help heal and nurture that relationship with their self? Mm, yeah. So doing the work, and what I mean by the work is uh, slowing down and possibly getting professional help, whether it's a therapist or a coach, to stand in front of you as a mirror to help you see the places where you're buying into some outdated limitation that maybe served you as a child, but no longer serves you now as an adult. An example of that might be that there's a deep feeling of unworthiness that you might have. And oftentimes that belief gets installed at a really young age, because if we have a parent who is abandoning us, blowing up on us, um, conditionally loving us, it is much more safe to be the source of the problem rather than have to live under the, the idea or the fact that maybe we have a wounded parent with limited capacity. So as a child, making my fault 
allows me then to have some sort of hope that I can be the source of the solution. What ends up happening though is we forget that we create that calculation. And then we move forward in life and we forget that we've got this core belief that it's my fault, that I'm unworthy, that all the things that are happening outside of me that maybe aren't in my control, they, they're because I'm unworthy. We forget that we have that. And so working with an expert, working with somebody who understands the architecture of identity and belief, you can start to go back and reframe that and see the truth of the situation rather than the strategic, brilliant plan B that you created to make sense of a chaotic world when you were little. Yeah, so that definitely put some light bulbs off in my head. And how can we know when we're doing that? Like, is there an awareness that we can bring so that we don't fall in that pitfall? Yeah, yeah. So if I hear the question, it's, yeah, how do, how do we know when perhaps we're being triggered and we're regressing back to that of a childhood state and responding from a place of unresourcefulness rather than our adult state? Yes, that's it. <laughs> right, okay, just want to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah, so, um, you know, I can notice this within myself. I mean, I, you know, as much as I've been doing this work and how um, passionate about it I am, uh, I still find myself in my relationship getting triggered at times. And so what I find for myself and all the clients that I work with is that I start to fight to be right. And I start to, uh, I like to say just, I start to die on certain hills that it's ridiculous that I'm dying on that hill. Like, why am I, like, why am I so, uh, like it's a life or death situation for me to be seen a certain way, to get my partner to change in a certain way. And oftentimes it's because there's some type of wounding that is coming up from the past that hasn't been healed, that is being presented to me to actually look at. And I'm taking a past story that's unresolved, I'm projecting it onto my partner, and then I'm back in some type of cycle that uh, was never really completed as a kid. So the first step is awareness and noticing when you start to get tunnel vision or when you start to really believe and dig in that the other person needs to change or shift in order for you to feel a certain way. That's typically a real good sign that you're getting triggered and that you're regressing to that state of a unresourceful kid. Um, your ability to observe the situation from a third party perspective, that goes away as well. So you start to lose perspective on what's actually happening. It starts to feel like a life or death situation maybe. Um, kind of goes back to this whole premise of dying on a hill. Uh, and oftentimes that's exactly what it felt like when you were a little kid is a life or death situation Because if you weren't able to prove something get love be seen a certain way The fear is I'm gonna be abandoned and if I'm abandoned as a kid I'm completely defenseless because I'm reliable on those Gods and goddesses that came before me to take care of me So that would be the first step is just becoming aware that this is in fact occurring And then the second step would be being able to out yourself and name it name that, that that process is actually occurring so that you can get back in pretty with it and you're not actually hiding something from your partner if you have a relationship that's built on transparency and respect which i'm assuming you do if you're in an intimate relationship with them that's huge like like naming it calling yeah. it out calling yourself out and saying hey this is what's this is what's going on for me and and just even saying it can can take the pressure off. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Uh, and and so, do you have any any tips or tools or guidance on how to keep that third party perspective? Like, if you go out of the third party perspective, I guess naming it would be the first step in getting back into that uh, observer perspective. Is there anything else that that could help? Yeah. Definitely, great question. So uh, this is from, I'm gonna take this from the premise of parts work. So parts work is uh, this idea that the human personality is a constellation of parts. Different parts of you that came online at an early age to make sense of and survive situations when you were little. So you might've had a humorous part come online. You might have had a pleaser part of you that comes online that's constantly tracking other people's needs and making sure that they're okay so you can be okay. You might have another part of you that comes online later in life, and especially if you've been working with a therapist or doing some 
deep work where there's like a champion or an achiever part of yourself. Sometimes the achiever part of yourself can actually be based on insecurity. Um, I definitely can relate to that one. Lots of achieving in my life to try to fill some type of hole that I felt. So part of my work has been detaching from the achiever and finding new motivations to achieve things. But the, the point of this is that we've got these different parts that come online and sometimes uh, what we're experiencing when we feel triggered is that a part of us feels triggered rather than our whole aspect of ourselves feels triggered. So this is just a linguistic maneuver that can be super helpful, which is when you start to feel triggered, rather than saying even, I'm feeling triggered right now, which is better than saying nothing, it's to say, a part of me is feeling really triggered right now. And now just using that language allows you to actually get distance from the part of you that's, having, that's being triggered. It also assumes and communicates to your partner overtly that there's another part of you that's online that's open to have a conversation that can listen. Right? So I've isolated the part of me that is experiencing the trigger, the emotional upset, and I'm talking about that part objectively suddenly. Right? So there's part of me that's, that's feeling really triggered and is super angry right now. And I'm not, I'm not sure what to do about it. And then there's some other techniques too of like talking about that part, but I'll just, I'll pause there to make sure that makes sense. Is isolating the part as a part of you rather than being like, oh, it's all me. This is, I'm completely triggered right now. Does yeah. That yeah, that's great. It, and, and I love that when you isolate that part, then that leaves an open door for connection and, and communication in that. That's brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you got it. And uh, did you have more you wanted to say on that? or? Yeah, something else that's really tactical too is so that's in some ways talking about the feeling aspect of what's coming up and, and maybe being vulnerable about that. Um, I mean, I remember just recently in, in my current partnership, um, I, was, I was so triggered. There was something going on. I was traveling with my partner and I think I had some, made some really bad decisions around uh, Airbnb stays. And I was just getting the heat for it. I was, I was, and I, I felt like my life was under attack and it really wasn't. It's like they, my partner was just expressing her dissatisfaction with what was going on and she needed to vent. And I felt like I was on the guillotine about to get my head chopped off. And I found myself fighting for my life and getting really defensive and trying to logic my way out of it. And finally, I just realized it's like, what's actually happening underneath all this in the midst of it is I feel like a total failure. So I named it, I was like, a part of me feels like a total failure right now and I don't know what to do about this. I'm so confused. And it, just that shift, that was like the last thing I wanted to admit. I, didn't, I, I did not even wanna go there because it felt so true. It wasn't like a strategy or a tactic, it was just the truth. I felt like a total failure and naming that had me even feel more like a failure, but ironically, it completely changed the energy, right? So in that, another thing, and I can't remember if I actually said this, but I'll give an example of something that you could even take this farther is, so you name the emotion, you name the thing that's coming up, and you can use the, the, the parts language to isolate that part. And then you can even say, like, you know, there's this interpretation or this story that I'm making up that, like, you don't respect me anymore, right? There's the story I have that you're really angry and you think I should have done something completely different or that you told that, uh, you know, you, you've, you're falling out of love with me, whatever it is. But the key here, if you hear what I'm saying is, I'm not saying you don't love me anymore or you disrespect me because when I make an accusation like that, I'm not actually being vulnerable, right? And I'm not even, all I'm doing is I'm shutting down the other person's listening because I'm making an accusation about reality that is completely arguable. I'm not claiming my experience which is what I'm doing when I say I have a, there's an interpretation or a story that I got running in my head that this is what's happening. I weigh in on this because I'm losing my mind or I'm feeling crazy right now. Did you hear that? By the way, I think the, the Wi-Fi might have like came in and out. Did, that, did you it, hear it? I got it. Um, yeah, the, uh, that you, you name it and then, uh, then you, instead of like making an accusation, mm -hmm. you you express that you have this story running in your head about the other person, which doesn't say that it's true or not. You're not saying like, you don't love me or you don't trust me um, or you think I'm a failure. You're saying, 
I have this story in my head that yeah. that is telling me this thing. Yeah. And and that way they can be like, yes or no. Right. <laughs> yeah. Totally. yeah, totally. <laughs> and, and in some ways, go ahead. Yeah. I was just gonna say, you know, the the story they they could agree with you or not. You know, you don't okay. know, and that's you know, that's the the open door to to create the dialogue. You got it. You got it. Yeah. And, and it's also putting, it's making objective the feeling, and it's making objective the story so that we can, like if, if I make the, the feeling objective and I make the story of objective outside of me, then we can come together and align and look at that together. And what that does is now we're aligned, we're on the same team talking about this thing that's going on wow. and we can be problem solvers and co-create a solution together. Oh, I really like that. I like that, that it gets you to be on the same team and now you're looking for a solution together. That, yeah. that's, that's powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And I just want to throw this out here too. This is, this is, allow it to be messy, right? It's kind of like, this might be a bad metaphor, but I'm going to throw it out there because it's the first one that comes to mind because I did martial arts a lot when I was younger, but it's like training for a fight versus actually getting into it, right? You might learn the certain moves, but when all of a sudden some, you're in the middle of it, it's like you kind of have to rely on your instincts and it might be messy and it might not go, it's probably not going to go as planned at all. Just like you were talking about before uh, our call here, if you want to make God laugh, make a plan. Yeah. <laughs> so it's to take some of these principles in and to play with them and allow it to go off the rails and be messy and just trust that uh, it will get better as you continue to practice this because what you don't want to do is now add more self-judgment to an already heavy situation because you can't do it right or it doesn't feel as clean as you think it should look. Relationships are messy and the more that you can be okay with it being messy, the more capacity you have to handle truth and honesty in a relationship. Yeah, that's spot on. And, and what I really love about you, Clayton, is that you share so transparently and so authentically, and it, it really makes it so relatable. And, and I feel very connected to mm. your experience because it's my experience because you're sharing from your heart. Mm. So thank you for that. Um, mm. it's, it's very refreshing, uh, especially for someone who's uh, in that coaching position where you're like, hey, this, like, I'm still learning and growing and it gets messy in my life. And you know what? Like, you can be messy too. And so thanks, that, that really helps. Um, I feel like it, when, when people who are guiding and coaching, uh, it's like they show their humanness and, and vulnerability in, in an authentic way, then it, it's, uh, it gives everyone permission to just be freaking human. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Totally. totally. Yeah. Thank you for, for that. And uh, it's taking some time to get there. Hey, we're all works in progress. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a really interesting perspective about harmony versus truth in relationships. And I feel like this weaves quite, uh, quite lovely into <clears throat> what we've been talking about. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So um, I think I made a meme on, on Instagram a couple months ago. It said something like, uh, Healthy relationships are built on the foundation of truth, not harmony. And it, that's just to capture it in a nutshell. It came from my own life for sure. And it also came from talking to a number of clients who were struggling with this persona of people pleasing and operating in their relationships under this core unconscious, sometimes conscious belief that a relationship needs to be harmonious in order to be healthy. And that if we, if it starts to deviate from being harmonious, then <clears throat> something's wrong and it's a red flag and maybe you need to ditch the relationship completely. Now look, in some cases, I think that if you get stuck in a place where there's no harmony in the relationship at all, yeah, absolutely. There's probably something going on and you might have to decide whether or not you want to do the work with that person. Um, however, if relationships is built on this idea of it needs to be harmonious and there's not room for fights, and, and it's not, I'll just put a little caveat there, not even a caveat, just a, uh, an example. I've had people come to me and talk to me and they say, you know, we broke up, but our relationship 
it surprises me that we broke up. We never fought. It, we, we never raised our voices at each other. We, we never fought at all. And I see that as like, of course you guys broke up. I get it. Of course you broke up because something was being suppressed. Something was being repressed. You guys are two different people with two different value systems and somebody wasn't standing up and going to bat for themselves the way that was needed in the relationship. Did that come through? Yes, that did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And so what I notice in those kind of situations is that if you're only honoring harmony in a relationship, most likely somebody is compromising themselves in the relationship. Somebody is shape-shifting, turning into a chameleon because they're afraid to stand for their truth. And if you're afraid to stand for your truth, what that often results in is a hotbed of resentment that starts to get created underneath the surface. And then suddenly a breakup that happens out of the blue. And it's like, wow, I didn't even know anything was wrong, right? But there's all these little micro infractions in the relationship that because they're not confronted and it's not cleaned up, they add up and then there's a disproportionate response to one of them that happens and then one of the partners leave. So the power of being in truth in relationship is that you're fighting for the relationship. If you are honoring truth as a high value in relationship, you, you are saying like, I'm not going to let something slide within myself. If it's coming up, it's having, if it's starting to distort the image I have of my partner, I'm going to protect that fiercely, right? If my partner in my mind, the story I have about them starts to shift from somebody who I love, respect, and am loyal to, to something less than that, it is my responsibility to fiercely protect that by having the necessary conversations and cleaning things up before that starts to occur. I love that. That is a golden nugget. Thank you. <laughs> so that, uh, yes. And I've, I've seen it too. in with my friends where they're like, yeah, I thought everything was cool. And then all of a sudden, but it, it is those little micro things when you're not being true to yourself. And I, I love that you make it about, um, the perspective is that when your idea of the other person starts to shift, like, question that and bring that up. And so what, could you give us an example of what that might sound like? Yeah. Um, when you say what that might sound like, as in the communication towards the person uh, about what's happening? Yes. Yes. Because I feel like it, it could go very wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, mean, I, I want to just make it, I want to bring it back and make it, um, that, it, that there's no real magic to it. It's more like a stance. It's more like if something's coming up within me, that's having me get triggered, go back to what we were talking about earlier in the video saying like, you know, Hey, I have this story that's going on right mm, now okay. that, you know, that, um, because maybe like a date was missed or, you know, you said you were going to do something to the house or in the house and you didn't do it. Or there was some, you know, there's like a loss of integrity uh, in the relationship. I'm just giving an example. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll land it with this. Let's pretend that you're on a date with a guy or, and, uh, or you're, you've got a date planned with a guy that you've been seeing for a while and you notice there's a little bit of a lack of presence or he misses a couple uh, dates or forgets about something. If you start to interpret that as like, okay, well, I'm, I'm not significant to him or uh, like I'm not a priority at all and I'm not gonna go ask about that and question that assumption, I'm betraying him. I'm betraying him because I'm allowing that to seep in and start to create cracks in the foundations. So it could just be, uh, communicating and getting your ego out of the way and saying, you know, I've just been noticing this. I've been feeling um, like I, I'm, I'm not maybe as significant in your life as I would want to be. And I'm not sure if that's actually true, but I've got this story that there's other things that are more important right now for you. And it, like, I'm not really on that list. And I would love to just check in with you and see where you're at on things and just completely let go of this so i'm not living under that that this fantasy that i'm creating 
something to that nature. And that's just completely off the cuff, but I'm hoping that lands the idea of just how to, how to clean something up and stay true and uh, fight for the, the story that you have about the person that's intact of the person you want to be in relationship with. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. So yeah. I know that you have a free gift for our audience and it has to do with relationships. Would you share with us about that? Yeah. Well, you know, after uh, working with folks for, uh, through breakups and relationship reconciliation and helping them get back out there and create relationships that are actually working better than the ones that they had in the past, I have been in the privileged position of being able to see the things that work and the things that don't. And so I put a lot of attention on looking at the matrix of relationship. And uh, I've got this guide called the eight secrets to create a rock solid relationship. That's right on my site. I think the link's going to be somewhere here in the interview, uh, but it's eight principles, uh, eight mindset shifts, eight ways of looking at your relationship, things that you can begin to do distinctions that will help you keep it as healthy as possible. Um, and so if you want to know anything about me, and you'd like to get a little bit closer to the philosophy in which I operate, check that out. Check out my site. Send me an email if there's anything you think that I can help with. Yes, absolutely. And we'll have all of that information so that you can get connected with Clayton uh, on, on this page and in your email. And Clayton, it's been such a pleasure and honor to have you on the show. Uh, I'm, I'm, I learned a lot. I'm sure that our audience did too. And, and it's just... I, I really want to acknowledge you one more time for just being so real. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it out to me and asking the questions that you did. I really enjoyed this combo. Absolutely. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to Speaker Secrets too. And we'll see you again soon. Bye.